Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's very nice to have you all here. M my name is Dolph Talintro. I'm co-leading a cities cluster here. Um, and this particular talk is going to talk about sort of a project that we recently completed early in the year, which is based on nine months uh, of research originally, got extended into 12 months. We couldn't quite cram it in. But um, nevertheless, we have some research products that I'm going to be talking about. But uh, if you're interested, there are materials uh, that you can pick up in the back of the room, both uh, the research report and a couple of policy briefs. So feel free to, to bring them home. Uh, I would suggest doing it afterwards rather than all getting up now. <laughs> Although one of us, you know, having one of you doing that, we can bear with undoubtedly. Um, good. So we're going to be talking about the well-being and urban protracted displacement. Uh, particularly focusing on the case of Syrian refugees in Lebanon and Jordan. This is a topic of global relevance in the sense that globally we're talking about 21 million refugees. These are the estimated set of numbers. These numbers, of course, always estimates fairly rough, but nevertheless it gives us the sense of the scale. Um, and we also know that globally, out of these numbers, about two-thirds are ending up in urban areas. And this is a critical critical issue right now. What we see there's an emergence of what some people call the urban um, humanitarian development nexus, where humanitarians are starting to think urban, where development people start to realize that people uh, um, who are protectedly, protectedly displaced, which essentially means, which can, uh, which means that people might be displaced over uh, a generation long. I think the average figures that are bandied about currently are around two decades of being displaced from your home country. This means that we need to start thinking differently about these populations, often highly vulnerable, located in urban areas, at risk of urban destitution. And both humanitarians and development people start, need to start thinking about how can we understand their conditions in urban conditions, rather than against the rural templates and the camp templates, which are very much um, informed thinking uh, by humanitarian agencies historically. I should say, of course, this is an effort by a team of people. It isn't just me. I'm glad to see some of you here in the room who've uh, worked with me, Rajit sitting here, Rajit Laxman. Um, and this is also a collaborative effort sort of by a group of humanitarian practitioners and researchers like ourselves. And those practitioners were based on the ground uh, in both Lebanon and Jordan. Uh, a French INGO called ACTED and um, our other research partner was Impact Initiative. So we also worked with um, a specialist from the um, Notre Dame University in, in Beirut. You're probably familiar with some of these figures here. Um, both Lebanon and Jordan are, have made sort of an, an incredible effort in hosting very, very large groups of Syrians. So we know that sort of around 5 million Syrians have left the country fleeing the civil war. Uh, another 6 million are internally displaced within, still within Syria. And of course, the Syrian war has moved on and is slowly progressing towards an end stage, if you like. But we know that sort of a very disproportionate number of Syrians have fled to neighboring countries. And particularly Lebanon and Jordan have made an extraordinary effort. You look at the numbers here. Um, Lebanon has a domestic population, 9.5 million people, and sort of taking on 1.27 million additional Syrians. So representing 13% of the population on top of the existing population. And those existing populations, of course, also harbor already uh, a range of refugee groups. Um, historically, particularly Palestinians have ended up sort of in these countries, uh, but also Iraqi refugees during the Iraq wars. In Lebanon, this number is even more sort of disproportionate. Nearly a quarter of the population added on top of the existing uh, domestic population. Now, just as a sort of reference point, perhaps, the European Union, we're talking about, anyone wants to make a guess? What sort of percentage of European sort of Union population has been? Refugees. Yes, from Syria in particular? Oh, 1%. Yes, exactly. Well, that's, that's a very accurate sort of, <laughs> well, Richard, wow. Maybe we if you should... Coming in late, I wasn't... No, I mean, with intervention like this, I mean, perfect. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. exactly. But this gives us a very strong sense of what is going on what here. What is the number again, sorry? A quarter of a percent. 
So we have, in the total of the European Union, we have just as many Syrian refugees um, as in Lebanon, more or less. Okay? In 2017. Latest figures, 2017. But of course, the numbers change a little bit over time. The UK has committed to 20,000 set of Syrians over a five-year period from 2015 onwards. Okay. And the figure on the right shows you how quickly the initial sort of population flow sort of emerged. Within a very short panel, uh, span of time, sort of a tremendously large number of, of Syrians that ended up in Lebanon. And you can imagine that it has caused tremendous strain on, on urban systems. We know that about 80 to 85% of the Syrians ended up in urban areas. And in Lebanon in particular, there was a no-camp policy. So Lebanon didn't want to have camps. And that has to do with this historic experience of hosting Palestinians in camp situations. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. In Jordan, about one in five Syrians ended up in the large camps. And the large camps, Zatari, uh, Azraq, al mafraq they've sort of, they've in a way hogged the limelight. Sort of much of the, sort of the pictures, the visualization of the refugee crisis has honed in on these large camps. But of course, it's only sort of capturing 20% of the total number of Syrians. So what it all means that sort of in both countries, which are already highly urbanized, there's been a tremendous, tremendous additional pressure on urban systems. Basic systems around sanitation, electricity, uh, water supply, urban housing, already weakly organized, already um, inadequately serving existing populations, have suddenly witnessed this, this tremendous inflow of additional groups of people who also needed to be accommodated. And this has led to a tremendous amount of densification in urban neighborhoods, particularly in lower income neighborhoods, urban informal settlements. And now we see a growing and growing race to the bottom where the worst urban conditions are sought out actively by refugee populations because those are the only locations where they can, they can afford to live. At the same time, we've seen a tremendous amount of rent increases. I've seen figures which suggest that rents from the beginning of the crisis till last year have inflated three or fourfold in urban areas, so as an average. And that, of course, has affected both hosts, particularly the poorer communities in these, in, in these cities, as well as the newcomers. So many of these strains are borne by both host communities as well as by refugee communities. And as a consequence, there's been a, a precarious balance, if you like, very highly strained social relations, and it is in, in many ways quite remarkable that given the pressures that are occurring within the system, by and large, relations are peaceful and have remained peaceful, but definitely at a large cost. So the question that sort of this research informed was, what modalities of reception drive what kind of gendered well-being outcomes for refugees and host com communities in urban Lebanon and Jordan, and what explains for these outcomes? And the way in which we conceptualized, I, sh I should say a bit roughly, modality of reception was, we, th we, we, we wanted to deliberately include, and this is based on our understanding of urban systems, the role of urban informality. We, we wanted to include in our analysis what's happening in terms of both the formal responses, but also the informal responses in these urban areas. So we conceptualize modality of reception as comprising those formal and informal arrangements, policies, programs, and implementation practices that constitute more or less enabling environments for refugee and host communities to enjoy safe, dignified, and worthwhile lives and achieve well-being, as people themselves define this. So a very long definition, but we want it to be fairly comprehensive. So what we see here sort of in the diagram is the different sort of modalities, forms of these modalities of reception that were at play. And in, um, in sort of a, a co, well, in a joint decision-making process with our partners, we focused on three key areas. We looked at economic participation, we looked at housing, and we looked at issues around legal status and rights. Those were deemed to be key areas 
that sort of our partners in particular wanted sort of us to help uh, help them make sense of the existing data because this was a project running for nine months. We were very strongly instructed by the funders, which are the uh, the Dutch Social Science Research Council (NWO) to focus on existing data rather than collect new data. They gave us nine months to look at the existing data and try to bring some synthesis because recognizing there's a lot going on in that particular space. And we used the analytical framework around well-being, sort of, which the, uh, the Bath Group on uh, working on well-being and development sort of used, which is essentially looking at three ways, complementary ways in which we need to understand well-being, both in a material sense, what do people have or what do they not have in terms of income, in terms of access to key services, etc. Classic capability, skills, that kind of stuff, what you have, what you don't have. Secondly, relationally, how can we understand sort of how people live together rather than living on their own? How do people achieve well-being by, through social relations, but also through relations with uh, actors uh, who are powerful, the state, and other kinds of power holders, if you like? And the last point is around subjective well-being. How do people themselves assess where they are, given the material conditions in which they find themselves, given the achievements and deficits that they have on their own well-being priorities? How do they themselves subjectively assess where they are? So those, that was essentially the analytical framework that we used. And the pictures on the right sort of, again, represent sort of those three key areas, legal status, housing, and work, or economic participation. Now, as I alluded, this was a, quite a quick exercise, um, focusing chief, chiefly on secondary data, but we did manage to cram in a little bit of primary research because we wanted to. <laughs> we didn't want to leave that opportunity uh, unturned. Um, but our sort of main effort was around a systematic review of the literature. And this entailed screening three databases, on a, on a set, of, set of keywords, uh, and we found around sort of 400 sort of journal articles that we then screened for abstracts, initially for titles and for abstracts, then subsequently we sifted out sort of the ones that were particularly relevant, we, we felt, and we, we screened sort of um, around 171 articles. So it was a significant sort of effort. In addition, we recognized there were sort of research reports from INGOs, from various other sort of organizations that we also try to sort of connect with and we had a couple of sort of key informant interviews with people within the, for instance, the UN system or within the, the, the international sort of uh, efforts trying to support sort of uh, refugee population. And last but not least, we worked together with a group of women within an urban informal uh, area sort of in, in Beirut um, and this comprised both Syrian women as well as sort of Lebanese women, and they themselves, through participatory video exercise, explored some of the aspects of well-being. And you can see the video sort of uh, online. It's it's up there. Um, we should be able to provide you a link if you're keen. But uh, just search the uh, the website of IDF. You'll find it, and it's called All Humans Under One Sky. So, what did we find? So the, perhaps the first question that you could consider is why do people want to be in cities? Now, classically, people want to be in cities uh, for reasons of economic opportunities, for reasons of um, social opportunities, freedoms, freedoms from certain social restrictions. Cities are good for allowing you sort of to do to what you want, to be who you want to be. Um, but we also know that particularly in case of sort of the, the refugee population, cities also allow for anonymity. They allow you to, to stay um, under the radar, to be unnoticed from the authorities who you may have various reasons to fear. So, Having given this introduction, sort of what I want to do next, I want to sort of explore some of the, the findings from the literature. What do we know about the sort of well-being outcomes using the, that framework that we applied? And then sort of the next step will be to look at sort of so what is the relation that these well-being outcomes have 
to first of all sort of to public policy and law at a national level and at the end of the lecture we're going to talk a little bit about what is the relation to local uh, dynamics, local uh, policy initiatives. And other local power holders. So one of the key reasons if we think of urban housing and sort of well-being successes and failures, and particularly failures, are around sort of this chronic shortage of affordable housing. Um, this has different reasons in, in Jordan and uh, in Lebanon. In, I mean, and in many ways, these two countries are very, very different. I should perhaps underline that for those of you who are not familiar with the countries. Um, Jordan is relatively well governed, uh, highly centrally governed, strong states. Uh, ultimately, all authority resides with the king. Um, Lebanon, of course, emerged from a civil war in 1992, if, which, I mean, it, I remember it well from my childhood watching the news. It was always on the news, Beirut in tatters. Um, so the civil war in, in, um, lasted for, from 1975 to 1992 uh, in Lebanon. Lebanon also has a very different sort of demographic profile. If you, if you look at sort of the, uh, the, the social composure of, um, of the population, uh, much more uh, diverse in terms of religious affiliations, uh, large populations of Christians, Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims, um, Palestinian uh, refugees, um, and then sort of various other subgroups. But in contrast, Jordan is much more homogenous, with a very strong and large um, Sunni pop majority. In, in addition, the Palestinian minority is also significant and important in terms of the politics of the country. But So what we see here across both countries is this, they both suffer from this chronic shortage of housing. And in Lebanon, this is particularly an outcome of, if you like, a highly neoliberal state, where, which has heavily privatized sort of, um, uh, housing. It has sort of, uh, in, and in both countries, simply the state hasn't built enough. But in, in Lebanon, um, the state has also actively withdrawn from building houses. Uh, weak urban planning, uh, planning systems are in place across both uh, countries, but in Lebanon there are, there are also evidence that where the state wants to sort of actively plan, it can deliver actually a very good outcome. But it hasn't always been willing to apply that, and particularly in urban informal settlements, it has deliberately sort of withdrawn its hands from making any kinds of provision uh, for the inhabitants. Now, as a consequence of this, this lack of affordable housing and this, and this skyrocketing of rents, um, people have been frequently moving around, refugee populations in particular, moving around in order to find the cheapest place to live. Um, that may, of course, negatively affect their ability to develop sort of enduring relations with, uh, with neighbors, with, um, within the neighborhoods, with authorities locally. We also see there has been a very strong um, race to the bottom, if you like, to its conditions of living, which are materially um, highly sort of, uh, detrimental in terms of uh, highly densely populated sort of locations people end up living in. And these locations typically, uh, in case of both, um, and particularly in Lebanon, this is the case, uh, slightly less so in, in Jordan, but um, sort of the government neglect of informal settlements of different sort of types, whether or not sort of they were uh, started initially as official camps for Palestinian refugees, which have over time become urbanized and sort of attached to the cities and become integral parts of the cities, or whether those were unofficial camps, again, for Palestinian groups, or uh, another set of camps, we, or not camps, informal settlements, you can think of sort of in, in the context of, um, of Lebanon, sort of concerns sort of large areas, particularly in certain Southern Beirut, sort of where um, local Shia sort of populations, rural migrants have moved to and have commenced, started living, squatting on, on land, not being serviced. So there are different population groups living sort of in informal sort of settlement conditions and also are governed sort of by quite different sets of actors. And this we'll come back to in a little while. Overcrowding was very much noticed in the literature as being a key source for well-being failures. And this is both happening within the level of the settlement, but also within the level of the household. So house, households 
get more and more people living within sort of smaller and smaller spaces. And this is, is associated in literature all kinds of conflicts. Conflict with, within families, um, it's associated with badly behaved children, it's associated with violence against, um, against women. Similarly, fear of not knowing neighborhoods and fear of safety have also had particularly detrimental effects uh, on women who feel constrained to stay within the house. They do not, but I've seen figures which suggest that about 50% of surveyed um, groups of Syrian women were not leaving the house, therefore becoming socially heavily isolated, and particularly given the conditions of these houses where overcrowding is growing and growing, sort of, there were real concerns about uh, depression, mental health challenges, uh, simply not having privacy and, and lacking peace of mind. Finding a place where you can just, you know, step away and, and have a little bit of peace and a little bit of quiet, harder and harder to get. As there is such a big surplus demand for low, uh, cheap housing, the role of landlords has become incredibly, uh, the power of landlords has become incredibly skewed. And there are all kinds of abuses taking place uh, between landlords and tenants. This is a very important area that's, that's causing sort of, that's, there's an area of concern for, uh, for tenants. And in addition, sort of, there is no way in which refugee groups can actually go and look for protection from the state for various reasons, but they're effectively inadequate and inadequate sort of discriminatory sort of legal safeguards, policing and judicial systems in place for the refugee populations. Can I just ask, how much of this housing is rent by the refugees themselves? How much is provided by international agencies? Uh, it's chiefly privatized renting. Um, international agencies support the camps, for instance, in Jordan, um, and they also have made efforts to try to support private landlords in terms of offering upgrading of the housing in exchange for lower rents, but they often don't have the resources to, to do that at scale. And we're talking about huge scale here. Yeah. So um, the main housing options that people have are squatting, finding yourself a place just to strike down, uh, abandoned sort of office spaces, uh, etc. Um, small pop-up informal settlements. Only very small ones are, are allowed. So the ones that grow bigger than 20, so the, the local authorities swoop down and make sure they, they are demolished. Um, private rental housing. Um, and then we're looking at uh, camps, of course, in Jordan. Those are sort of the, the main sort of types of housing that people can find. Um, but we also see that about one in five of the, of the Lebanese households, so they, they have sort of refugees staying within the family. And although three quarters sort of charge rent, so there's a quarter which doesn't. So there, is also, so there are also other forms of hospitality taking place uh, that, might be, um, that might be important areas where well-being is, is achieved for both. Um, now, more broadly, so there's a very strong culture of hospitality that sort of supports sort of these millions of people. And this is not some, something to be dismissed. Uh, and it's been, it, it might well be an in, important part of the glue that has kept sort of society sort of together. Um, and these forms of hospitality sort of mean that you have to offer um, people temporary refuse, temporary um, treat people as, as a guest. But of course, these forms of hospitality also don't mean that people have, have rights. It's always based on a giving and there is some form of reciprocation sort of needed. So if we look down at sort of what we can find in the literature on sort of economic participation and well-being, there's a couple of things that I think we should sort of first of all look at. Sort of importantly, the war in Syria has had all kinds of economic consequences for neighboring countries in terms of affecting trade, um, exports of, of importance of agricultural produce, and it has had real sort of economic slowdown effects on both Jord the Jordanian and the Lebanese economy. But this has nothing to do with the refugees. Just simply the war itself has affected sort of, uh, has had some, some serious sort of economic impacts. Now, in addition to that, of course, we see that sort of the, the inflow of, of refugees 
Uh, and the responses by the state have been costly. The state has, um, I mean, I've seen reports from the World Bank, which were talking about um, the Jordanians that have governed both having less tax revenues, um, having more, significantly more spendings to make in order to, to support sort of the, the, the inflow of refugees. Um, and at the same time, of course, you can imagine sort of the labor supply has tremendously grown in a very short period of time. So some of those assessments are about sort of 30 to 50 percent additional sort of labor uh, coming into cities sort of, and people um, so desperate and so badly in need of work to survive um, also willing to undercut existing rates of labor. And there have been there's strong evidence that um, statistically significant sort of collapses in wages have occurred within these economies. But they have occurred chiefly for the poorest paid professions. This is really important. So most of the brunt of, um, of the inflow of, of new labor has been borne by the poorest groups within the cities. We also see the very important sort of most of the work that sort of the refugees are engaging in or are allowed to engage in better uh, are in the informal in the informal sector, where of course there are important sort of trade-offs um, to be seen between gaining an income on the one hand, but on the other hand, sort of perhaps working in condition actually working in conditions where you have no um, you have no way of saying no to demands that your boss might make. Um, hazardous working conditions, uh, very long sort of working hours, um, essentially highly unequal power relations between employers and, uh, and workers. And this, of course, has, has effects um, in the sense that you might be willing to sort of to, to gain an income, but at the same time, you'll have to bury or you have to carry the, the humiliation that sort of work might entail for you. So there are important sort of trade-offs that people have to have to um, face or that, that people face. Um, similarly, we know that in Jordan, um, I've seen figures for 20, 2015 where 32,000 children are involved in labor. Um, children have become an important sort of breadwinner in many of the Syrian sort of families. Uh, and often for reasons related to, to fathers not being able to to work, and that's often related itself to legal status. So for children, of course, this sort of, this, this entails sort of uh, a trade-off between being in school versus working, um, discounting the future in, in a way. We also see that sort of shifting gender roles within sort of households have created a lot of, um, a lot of tension. Uh, with uh, a lot of tension, a lot of family conflict and violence within households uh, of, of refugees. Where the men are unable to provide sort of, uh, uh, as the breadwinner, where they're unable to fulfill their traditional role within these families to be providing um, and sitting at home and fearing um, to go outside of the house for reasons of um, not having valid documentation, for instance, has driven all kinds of conflict within households, particularly where women have, and children have subsequently had to step up in order to bring in income. At the same time, for the women who did bring income, sort of, they were still also expected to continue caring for the family and performing sort of the caring sort of, uh, functions that were assigned to them. OK, what about sort of, I've been alluding to this, sort of the legal status. Now, in many ways, legal status is underpinning a tremendous amount of vulnerability uh, for the refugee populations and is a continuous and chronic source of stress anxiety and, and depression. This is very well documented. Now, the process basically is that if you come to a country, and I should say that neither Jordan nor Lebanon have, have signed the International Refugee Convention, and they do, they do not have official policy to, um, to offer asylum or to offer um, a status of refugee ship, if you like. Okay, so people come, they are considered foreigners, or they're considered guests, or temporary displaced populations. They've been given various sort of labels, but the key point is they're not having a right um, to, uh, to demand um, support. When you enter the country, you do, however, have to make yourself known, you have to declare yourself, you have to sort of gain legal status. You have to be registered with the UNHCR, and then you need to obtain legal residency permits or status from, from the government as well. 
And of course, the government is also sort of will screen you sort of for security reasons because there have been incursions, for instance, of, of ISIS militants in, in both countries. So there are sort of legitimate concerns around security that the state has to sort of take care of. Um, but we know that sort of the, the difficulty for many people in, in the graph here is for Lebanon. It shows you how the households, with all, households having all members successfully obtained legal residency. And this figure, as you see the graph, is plummeting quite sharply from 58% of households having all its members gaining this status in 2014 to only 19% in 2017. So that means that majorities of households are actually, are actually illegal, illegal in the country. And that has all kinds of knock-on effects in terms of gaining access to services. Critically, this is really important. If you do not have legal status, you will not have access to, to health, to education for your children, um, to marriage or birth certificates. And these populations are often very young, so this is highly relevant. Sort of more than, more than half of them are sort of below 24 years of age. So is that metric then? Uh, it's for Lebanon. The metric is for Lebanon. I think that's dropped off sort of the... Uh, but yes, thank you for asking. Uh, it's barring you access to formal work. And of course, if you're illegal, deemed illegal, if you don't have sort of valid legal status, you are at risk of detention, arrest, and potentially deportation at any point of time. And this is a really important factor that is in people's mind, particularly if, if, you, if you don't have legal status. The fear of arrest and detention is, is, a, is a very heavy burden to carry. So how can we explain for these kinds of well-being outcomes then. So let's first have a look at national level policy and law, which have a lot to account for. Um, we, observe, we observe three, in a way, three different, three different key findings. What's policy and law got to do with it? The first one is around the frequency of policy change. We observe that both in the areas of housing, economic participation, and in terms of legal status, the states keep moving the goalposts. And that's a really important sort of factor, because it's very difficult for, particularly for refugee populations, to understand what are their entitlements, their obligations, and possibly, if, if at all, any rights. So this is an example here, and we've set this out sort of in, in our report in more detail across these different themes thematic areas, but, and, and it was pretty hard to get your head around because things, even as a sort of, you know, as an analyst, you see there, there's continuous movement in terms of public policy. So the first one in 1973. Correct. And I think that's for Palestinians. Because they are the what, what we've done here, we, we wanted, to, and this is what we did across the study, we looked 20 years back because we felt that maybe it's important to think about it, how previous groups of, of refugees have been treated, what does it sort of tell, tell us in terms of the institutionalization of responses? So 1973 is coming up here, um, in this case sort of in Jordan, sort of, ident sort of set, of, set about sort of a law that sort of, that sort of determines sort of that the Ministry of the Interior has the power to determine whether or not illegal entrants are deported, and also sort of setting out sort of essentially the status of, of newcomers as foreigners. Potentially, but yeah. The thing is, right. it's still mixed because it's often that kids mm -hmm. saying, don't treat refugees as a special group. Until this day, they are treated as refugees after more than 30 years. Yes, the situation of the Palestinians, you're right, is, is particularly, um, well, actually particularly sort of acute sort of in Lebanon, more so than in Lebanon. Although, I mean, so what's happened in Jordan is that Jordan has assigned sort of status, full citizenship status to Palestinian refugees except for people coming from the Gaza Strip. And that's about, it figures sort of cited are around 100,000 people. So yes, they are still deemed what foreigners, but all the other Palestinians coming from the West Bank, uh, for instance, they are sort of have gained full citizenship status. And that's an entirely different response that, than has happened sort of in case of Lebanon, where um, the Palestinians even now do have have, have very little rights. They have no, no, they have no rights to work. They have no rights to own uh, land or property. Um, they have no rights of residency. So they are really, 
um, a third class citizen, I would say, in, in, in Lebanon. Okay, but the point sort of around sort of the, the diagram here was, and we, we can have a follow-up chat about that, um, is that sort of policy changes over time. So 2011, the onset sort of open borders, everybody's welcome, very quickly as sort of the numbers increase heavily, there was an inability to deal with these numbers and sort of the Jordanian government decided to close many of the, the existing borders except for one. That has all, all kinds of consequences. Uh, for instance, that all refugees had to, some, some refugee groups had to actually actively cross um, battle lines. Um, but it's, there was still one point where you could cross. But then sort of as sort of further as the as the influx continued by 2013, sort of the government started selecting who is going to be allowed to come in. And large groups were sort of disallowed. So Palestinian refugees from Syria, not allowed. Iraqi refugees from Syria, not allowed. Um, a young, able-bodied man of, of military age, not allowed. So there was sort of growing sort of selection of people um, allowed to enter the country. And by 2016, the border was fully closed after a terrorist attack sort of killed um, a number of, of soldiers. Um, within Jordan. Now yeah. it's open again. Now it's open again. Last week. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. But then I didn't have time to update these figures. <laughs> All right, good. The second point that we noticed was a very... So, so policy changes frequently. The second point was there's a very strong interlocking of policies going on. So if you fall foul of one policy, that has effect on how other policies treat you. Um, so let me, I mean, this is a complex sort of diagram in a way and, and probably not entirely correct because policies keep changing, <laughs> but we try to make sense of this. Um, so think about somebody who sort of crosses the border regularly. This is in Lebanon. You first have to go sort of to get yourself registered at UNHCR, uh, which sort of, you know, does a screening, sees whether you have, uh, whether you might be determined to have official refugee status. That means refugee, you can, you know, UNHCR might assign you that status to make an application elsewhere. So you can seek asylum, but in a third country, not sort of in Lebanon or Jordan itself, because it doesn't have sort of policies that can actually sort of cater to that. So you have to do that at the same time, sort of if you cross the border. And so you need to sort of get UNHCR sort of registration in order to get a residency permit. The situation in Lebanon was that you get the first year free. You can stay for free for the first, for the first year. After the first year, you have to start paying uh, 200 US dollars per uh, per adult or adult adolescents that are older than, 50, older than 15 years of age. Every year. So that's where this little loop comes in. And you can imagine as the crisis continues and as you remain displaced, this becomes a heavy burden, a very heavy financial burden. Another way of getting that residency permit was to get a Lebanese person to be your sponsor, your kafil. Your, he, he would be your warrantor, making sure that if there are any sort of uh, things, any things go wrong, if you sort of do sort of encounter the law, they would have to stand sort of guarantor for your good behavior and they would be responsible. That was another way. But again, by creating the sponsorship category, there was a whole black economy starts coming up where people could buy for $1,000 uh, a sponsorship of somebody that they didn't know but who was willing to provide that service, if you like. This is all fine. As long as you keep sort of your residency permits, the risk is only of impoverishment over time. But of course, at some point of time, we've seen sort of that within many of these, these households, sort of, um, not all the members were retaining this legal status. Once you become illegal, it suddenly bars all kinds of access to, to other services, including birth, marriage, uh, birth and marriage registration. So as a consequence, 30, well, this is for Lebanon... I think one in three children are, are not sort of, who are born in Lebanon, are not registered. Not being registered means that you essentially are faceless, legally faceless. You have no legal status, both in the eyes of the Lebanese state, but also in the eyes of the Syrian state, if in truth you want to return. You become stateless, essentially. Extremely vulnerable, therefore. It also bars your access to, to, to work. It's, if you have that illegal status, the risk are that sort of in the town where you live, you might be stopped at a, at a checkpoint, and again, you might sort of be ending up sort of in detention, arrest, and potentially the risk of deportation is there too. So legal status is an absolutely critical factor in creating vulnerabilities through interlocking policies. <laughs> 
the sponsorship performs a similar function in terms of making sure that you are sort of recognized. Yeah, because in Jordan, if you're going to a refugee camp, you don't need sponsorship. You just like... Okay. Situation in Jordan is slightly different. Uh, in Jordan, if you go to a refugee camp, you still have to be screened by the security forces. You still get UNHCR registration. Then everything will, will be provided for in the camp. However, if you want to work outside the camp, you're not allowed. And if you want to get out, you need a sponsor. There it comes in. You need to be bailed out, as they call it. And again, the bailing out has generated a black market economy around um, you know, these services being provided. But the Netherlands is different. Yes, it is different. Yes, definitely. But a key point is that, and this also applies in Jordan, the interlocking of policies is creating sort of vulnerability. And legal status is right at the heart of it. The third point that we highlighted sort of in our analysis is that the complexity of navigating bureaucracies is a real, um, is one of the key reasons why well-being failures are generated. So this is the example, I think, very clear for birth registration in Lebanon. If you want to get sort of two, I mean, it takes seven steps at the bottom. If you want to get all the way to the end, you get a family booklet, an individual family civil ex extract. That might not be needed. You might need sort of to get to step four. If you, want to be, if you want your child to be deemed having a legal identity. If you want to get your child a birth certificate, you need to get to step four. Now, step one is, you know, the child is born. You need to get a notification issued by the doctor or the midwife. 95% of the Syrian refugees succeed in that. Step two, you have to go to your local authority, Mukta, just at the neighborhood level. Oops, 70, 78% sort of are left. Next step, you have to move one, one level up in the administration to the district level. 36% are left. And finally, if you want to register with the foreigners registry, this is where only 17% of the children are left and successfully register. Okay? So bureaucracy is, is intimately involved in, in creating um, barriers, in this case, for civil registration for the children. But also, at every point of time, it incurs costs for people to go, spend time, um, travel to offices, etc. And not to say that the chances of being kept on hold, being kept waiting for a long time, uh, dealing with bureaucrats who may not feel like they have to sort of give you any kind of service whatsoever. Um, so people, refugees often report this as to be extremely humiliating, having to go through the rigmarole of doing this. And that's another reason why these figures drop so heavily. So that's at the national level, if you like. What then about sort of urban authorities? What's going on in, in the cities itself? Is there something distinct uh, that we should pay attention to? So we see that municipalities have been largely at the forefront of, of the response to the, to, the, to the crisis. But nevertheless, the humanitarian response initially has sidestepped. This deliberately decided not to engage municipalities. That's now different, sort of particularly on the back of the, the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016, which identified a, a localization agenda. Sort of, there's much more engagement with municipalities. And municipalities have been, have been really important also in terms of, sort of initiatives by mayors. mayors. Some mayors have been very generous. Others have been much more constraining and restrictive on, on refugees. So, let me give an example. Sort of, the picture on the right is, is showing you a banner uh, declaring um, that Syrian refugees in, in the area of uh, the municipality of Burj uh, Hamoud, sort of in, in Beirut, are not allowed to go out after 8 p.m. at night till 6 p.m. in the morning, 6 a.m. in the morning. So, municipalities, and this has happened in over 40 municipalities in Lebanon itself, where local authorities decided that people's mobility is going to be essentially constrained, regardless of reason. So you imagine sort of the kind of consequence that may have in terms of if you have to go to the hospital at night, if you, you, know, you want to socialize, see your friends, etc., etc. Highly constraining and, and a big role for the municipality. On the other hand, we also see that some mayors have been organizing events, sports events, bringing together different refugee and sort of local communities, trying to sort of balance and foster sort of positive sort of social relations. But essentially, we don't really know what's going on here. This is very poorly reported on, uh, and an important sort of research agenda to my mind. And um, we should also note sort of that municipalities in, in Lebanon have a very odd relation to the people living there. 
the people are actually not voting in the local municipalities in many instances. People are registered where they have grown up. So particularly in case of migration, people coming you know, from rural areas to the city, sort of, the chances are that they are actually voting in the village, but they're not sort of voting locally. So there's, there's no political accountability uh, or limited political accountability um, within sort of an auto, a democratic system. And the last point sort of at the local level, which is, uh, to my mind, is really important and completely uh, underexplored, uh, or, or rather underexplored, I should perhaps say, um, is the role of sort of urban non-state actors that exercise public authority. So let's go back to these informal settlements, say in Beirut, where we can think of, you know, the southern parts of Beirut sort of are essentially large informal settlements where uh, Hezbollah and um, the Shia Amal movement govern. They have built up these informal settlements uh, on sort of public land or privately owned land, sort of not being given any kind of services by the state because they were informal for long periods of time, but they self-organized and they built their own stuff and they ultimately organized politically too and sort of become part of the state. So these, that's one area sort of in Beirut. Then we look at another area in Beirut, the Palestinian sort of camps where the state has completely withdrawn from, from any kind of, of governance. It effectively had an agreement in place with the Palestinian Liberation Organization agreeing that PLO itself would govern and would provide security in, the, in these settlements for a period of time, or was later abrogated. But these areas are completely neglected, um, and there are, of course, popular committees, Palestinian popular committees who are organizing people and who are wangling and mediating with the state sort of for various kinds of services. But govern in an entirely different manner. So there's two examples of how within the same city you might be having very different modes of, of, of planning, of service provision uh, in place. And we have, in a way, quite limited understanding of how these kind of organizations actually mediate those relations between poor local communities and impoverishing refugee groups. And these informal settlements are becoming increasingly important. They become, if you like, and this is a, sinks for the poorest. So there's a, con a concentration of the poorest ending up in these settlements, and these settlements are sort of, you know, are sort of governed at a distance by the state. And there are other actors in place who govern, and we have no idea how their way of governance, their rules, uh, their permissions, uh, the, the ways in which they provide access to jobs, perhaps to, to services, how, that, how they sort of play out sort of differently for those different populations living, living there. So whereas Palestinian sort of camps were originally sort of populated chiefly by, by Palestinians, now I've seen some assessments which say that 30% you know, of the population are non-Palestinians. Okay. Now the humanitarian development nexus sort of doesn't engage at all with these actors for various reasons. Um, one of them is that some of these organizations are deemed beyond the pale um, I'm thinking of um, and they declared sort of you know, officially terrorist organizations, for instance, by the U.S. government, uh, Hezbollah, for instance, uh, or thinking in Jordan, sort of uh, Hamas has an important sort of uh, role also for its constituencies in providing services, providing welfare, providing social protection. Um, so, but the international humanitarian sort of agencies don't really sort of connect. And but of course, there are sort of Gulf donors who do. And it's, those relationships are, are rather sort of unclear, but it seems to be particularly in, of growing import. So to conclude, we see that sort of modalities of reception in urban areas are driving important uh, and heavily sort of gendered well-being outcomes, both in areas of housing, economic participation, and in terms of legal status. And these are shaped sort of by national policies, but they are also mediated by local uh, urban public authorities. That means that in terms of outcomes, we see highly geographically and spatially distinct sort of outcomes within cities and across cities in these countries. So we should not assume that um, conditions of urban refugees are all the same, they're governed in a similar manner, that they have similar systems in, in which they operate and try to achieve well-being. To the contrary, the situation is a lot more complicated. So, to conclude then, sort of what we see is that opportunities to achieve well-being are based not just on who you are, 
whether you're a Palestinian refugee from Syria, whether you are a Syrian, whether you are an Iraqi, perhaps whether you're a Somali refugee, um, but whether you're rich, whether you're poor, I haven't really discussed that sort of today, but there's also evidence that sort of wealth determines access to citizenship status as does religious affiliation. Um, and therefore, it doesn't matter so much what, not just who you are, but also where you are, what kinds of well-being opportunities might be open to you. Thank you. Questions? Richard? Um, I wondered how Dutch Aid and its DFID also are supported, how they reacted to your conclusions. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I know that Dutch Aid is, is paying more attention to um, the role of non-state actors in, uh, particularly in conflict settings, trying to understand their role in governance, in, 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 in providing various kinds of um, services, security, um, etc. cetera. Um, DFID, I, I do not know um, where, where they're located on, on, in, in that respect, although I do know they are, I think, supporting the, um, the uh, Center for uh, Public Authority and Development at LSE. Um, uh, one of, although possibly through ESRC, I'm not quite sure how the funding uh, is located there. In many ways, what we have done, of course, is some of these findings are well known. I mean, you know, we found a tremendous amount of literature available, and it, it, it was a synthesis effort. Um, but then again, sort of, we had sort of participation of DFID and, uh, in sort of you know, end of project workshops and, and other sort of donors and other agencies in that sense. So to that extent, they're aware. But otherwise, I, I don't know how well they read the ideas website. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. Hmm. While you were doing the research, did you notice, or I mean, I mean, what's the changes that you could see between refu Palestinian refugees and other refugees and Syrian refugees' circumstances in the meantime? And the other question is why uh, why do you think uh, uh, Syrian refugees didn't come to Europe although they had the chance? Mm. And what are the reasons? Uh, uh, what happened to, to let them stay in Jordan and the land? I mean, mm. what are the reasons? Well, I suppose at the beginning of a crisis, you, you do not foresee how long it might sort of take. Um, we should also know that, of course, there are important social relations across borders. Um, tribal relations, family relations, for instance, between uh, Lebanon and, um, and Syria, so that there had been already before the war started, there were um, an estimated half a million sort of Syrian workers in the country because there, was a bilet there were bilateral agreements allowing free travel and free movement of, of, of labor between the countries. So there, was, you know, there are important sort of relations in terms of the families. People are intermarried. So, there's, so there are very strong social relations. It makes a lot of sense to stay nearby. In many ways, you find sort of a hospitable place with a culture that you're familiar with, um, people that you're familiar with. So in many ways, sort of, it, is, it, is, it makes sense to go for those nearby options rather than think of going to Europe. I would say and your other question was about um, what difference do you see? Well, I mean, this, Perhaps for my, I mean, so personally, I hadn't worked sort of in the region for a long time, okay? So I have lim a relatively limited background. But I was absolutely shocked by the way in which Palestinians, um, particularly in Lebanon, are, are treated. They are, uh, and that's an historical situation, um, you know? That's sort of the fact that you're not having a right to work, that you're not allowed uh, to, uh, to own property, uh, that you're not even allowed to, to because of that, those reasons, to get, uh, you're not allowed to have residency, that you're not allowed sort of to, to even sort of get a permission to maintain your house if you wanted to, whereas you have to from a municipality. Those kind of things I, f I find shocking, given that people have been there, you know, from the first wave, from 1948 to the second wave, 1967. Um, you know, this, this is multiple generations. And it's, it's, it is, I mean, that, 
it is it is it is heart rending sort of how the, the you know how marginalized the Palestinian sort of community is, um, particularly in Lebanon. In, in in Jordan, of course, as I explained earlier, the situation is quite different. And I should add for, before I go to you, Samchi, another very vulnerable group sort of those Palestinians who were living in Syria, you know, doubly displaced, doubly displaced and treated sort of doubly, uh, doubly poorly. So the first ones who were allowed, not allowed to cross the borders were the Palestinian refugees from Syria. Makes you think, sorry, Sonchi. Good point. Um, yes, very good question. Uh, thank you. The first point on aid, sort of, the different countries have played it out very differently. And perhaps the Turks have done so most successfully. The Turks have about two and a half million Syrians, um, but against a backdrop of a population of around 80 million people. Okay? So very different sort of in terms of the percentages, but the, the absolute numbers are, are absolutely massive, um, combining both countries, if you like. Um, so the Turks have used that sort of to sort of to wangle a very a relatively good deal with Europe, where Europe is compensating them essentially to warehouse sort of um, warehouse the refugees. Um, the Lebanese have been reflecting sort of sort of their sort of general sort of disorder in terms of governance. Perhaps they have been much less able to to negotiate sort of collective uh, collective aid sort of flows. The Jordanians have been better organised. They sort of came to. Um, the Jordan Compact is perhaps the best example, um, where, and I don't have the figures in terms of the aid flow, so I'm sort of, you'll have to look that up. But, <laughs> but um, so the Jordanians sort of negotiated sort of in 2016 at the London Donor Conference um, a big sort of package of aid, sort of, and they also negotiated sort of uh, preferential access of Jordanian produced goods to, U to, to the European markets, coming from special economic zones where the Jordanians promised they would have 15% of labor coming from, uh, from the Syrian refugee population. So they were looking at sort of to, to find both employment for local populations and for the Syrians and sort of force the EU sort of to, to cut them a deal and get sort of manufacturing sources and also towards the future sort of to keep developing the country. Can I also add something here? Because mm. I've been working, I was involved in this agreement mm. Yes, yes, I think this is a very important point. Sort of, in many ways, the competition at the bottom is not sort of so much between Jordanian sort of hosts and sort of uh, the, the refugee groups coming in. It's actually the refugee groups starting to compete with other migrant groups. So in, in, in the factories, sort of, I mean, so in agriculture, the Egyptians have a big role and sort of with Egyptian middlemen arranging for labor come to come and sort of do sort of the hard work. Uh, in the factories, there's, you know, large sort of South Asian, Southeast Asian sort of, uh, 
uh, groups of women sort of working, sort of doing sort of, you know, factory labor. So there's the pushing out sort of in the competition is actually sort of not so much with, with the, the host the groups. Front and USA. Yeah, right, yeah. Any comments, questions? Tina. The current one, the current ones are in, incredibly tense, as I understand it, um, because the, both the governments of Jordan and of Lebanon want sort of the Syrians to, to be going back. They want them to do to, you know, the war is nearly over. Three quarters of the country has been pacified by Assad and his forces. Um, you know, it's only Idlib sort of area sort of which still harbors three million people. Um, but, of course, you know, the UN agencies, UNHCR sort of in particular, of course, they, they argue it's not safe to, to return. And so there's a fundamental tension. There is, it's not sort of safe to go back. People will be at risk. And that also relates to your question, sorry, about sort of um, the connection between Assad regimes and whether there are some areas in the country which are better sort of in terms of hosting. And there is some evidence around that. That's right. And I've seen some anecdotal evidence um, where... Um, um, Sunni Syrian sort of populations fleeing to uh, Jordan uh, and no, sorry, to, to Lebanon in this case have been better hosted in areas which were governed, uh, where sort of Sunni majorities were located, rather than areas where Hezbollah was um, sort of in charge. So, so yes, it, it matters where you're going in that sense, and the the, the religious affiliation sort of are factors of um, you know can be factors of both support as well as vulnerability. Sorry, Tina. So, yeah, that was the one, right? Any other questions? Well, I, no, 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 sorry. I have. Sorry, was it something? No, no, no. That's no. fine. No, I was just wondering. I saw a hand raising as well. I just yeah. wanted to make sure I picked up. I haven't fully understood hmm. um, how much EU policy has been uh, providing. Um, pressures and ideas on keeping the Syrian refugees there, apart from aid. I mean, yeah. your point that there was a 10% reduction in tax or something, which I thought was yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Is there a coherent EU policy towards keeping refugees there as opposed to Turkey or whatever? And is it more than just mm. providing aid? Well, I, th I mean, if you look, I mean, I, I don't have the full answer to that question, but if you look at the current budget sort of that the EU sort of parliament has passed, there's a very sort of strong sort of rise in sort of uh, in border sort of uh, monitoring uh, funds. So provo keeping people out sort of having sort of more sort of more ships on in the Mediterranean sort of keeping people out. So, so yeah. that, that's, you know, the story of Fortress Europe is, 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 is still unfolding. Um, the extent to which the EU is coordinating aid and aid regimes, of course, is slightly different because not every, I mean, they have sort of a coordinated aid package. Mm -hmm. But of course, in addition, to, and there will be some coordination with, with the big sort of, um, sort of you know, um, bilateral donors. But I don't think there's a common position on that. So in, in many ways, of course, you know, whether or not sort of a refuge is offered is, is still open. It depends on sort of countries' sort of uh, migration, Im immigration policies. Yeah. So, Was there another question there, or no? Okay. Yeah. Go for it. One, two. I mean, we don't have to stay, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're keen, I mean, I'm happy to to answer. Uh, Tina and then Sunji. Yes, they can. Um, yes, they can. But do they um, much more? difficult picture. Um, so they have access to education, but sort of particularly also given that sort of children sort of are incorporated into the labor force, um, there's only 50% of children end up sort of enjoying sort of education, I think, in, uh, in Jordan, for instance. So yes, they have access to education um, and, of course, to education offered by the state. In Lebanon, um, quality education is not offered by the state, it's offered by the private sector. Um, and actually, I have seen instances where uh, private schools have made efforts to incorporate local refugee children 
um, to be part. So it's not that black and white. And there's definitely also efforts by uh, well-willing sort of um, schools uh, to incorporate. Yeah. Uh, and since uh, we had no budget in Jordan to, to establish a new schools, all the schools that they double check where the areas where the refugees, so they double check A, B, and sometimes C, is we able to offer teaching for all the yeah. refugees. But yeah. the thing is, as you mentioned, the manpower is there because same teachers are giving the shifts or by the third shift, mm -hmm. but not, they don't yeah. have the effort, they don't yeah. have the power to do it. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it, the barriers is like a little bit, so it's not the yeah. same quality of education, but still yeah. they do have. Well, there's, there's a separation also of sort of, of children within the system. That's another yeah. important sort of... Prior to the crisis itself, right. it was severely underfunded. Right, yes. Yeah. have the facilities how to do it as it was. I mean, even you have two feeders per school of 600 girls at least. So right. the conditions right. themselves yeah. are not conducive yeah. to any point. So prior conditions weren't good. Sort of the yeah. capacity was limited to sort of absorb sort of the, all the additional children. So one of the sort of solutions in both countries have, have emerged, or solutions, if you like, sort of responses have been to separate out sort of the local kids from the Syrian kids, have double shifts or triple shifts uh, in education. Um, and they've also limited sort of, as far as I understand, um, the ability of Syrian sort of teachers to actually sort of, to allow them to teach the children. At the same time, they've also sort of enforced sort of a different sort of curriculum on, on children where, where sort of refugee children would be getting a Syrian curriculum uh, and sort of local children, a local curriculum. So uh, in a way also limiting the opportunities of um, building sort of social relations be, um, at that level. Uh, so you? Related to the same question, the education and the immunization, do they have access to the children who are not in the system, maybe by birth certificate or whatever? Do they have access no. to the No, if you, have, if you don't have sort of um, a birth registration, you will not access the, the you, you cannot, I, you can't even sort of go to UNHCR sort of to get to your status sort of uh, registered. So you will have, you will have no access to, to um, education, to health. Um, so it's, it, it is a dreadful, dreadful situation, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm.